Hello, friends, and welcome. I'm your co-host, Andrew Lazaga, here with Dubside. And you're listening to the Dubcast with Dubside. Dubside and I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to all of you who donated to our GoFundMe campaign to send Dubside to Greenland. Yes, absolutely. It kind of reestablishes my my faith in what I'm doing. You know, sometimes you get in a slow period, you think, why am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I see if, if that many people believe in the uh, value of what I'm doing, it really uh, inspires me. So yeah, really appreciate that. I'm so happy to see people's names, some of which I recognize. And it's yeah. also great to get the messages of encouragement too from people. Yeah. Special shout out to the Hong Kong group. Thanks so yes, much. Indeed. Yeah. And it's so nice to see we have friends across the world. Mm-hmm. So what are your plans so far, Dubside? So I'm still firming up like where I'm going to go in, in Denmark and Norway and Sweden. But uh, yeah, the Greenland, I finally j- just yesterday morning got the actual dates of the competition. Great. <laughs> is, July 12th to the 19th. If I was if I was going to guess, I would have thought it was the week bef- earlier than that. So if I went ahead and got tickets, I would have been out of luck. <laughs> so, the competition is in Kokotok in South Greenland, which I've been to, what, three, four times already. And so I might fly into Nuuk, the, the capital, and then go down. I could go down on the ferry, which costs some money, but I, I might have enough for that with like the teams going to the competition, which is fun to do. But but so I, I've got I'm working up a whole list of people I want to interview. I don't know if I'll get to everybody. <laughs> so some of the names we, we've heard on the in the on various past episodes, we like Karen Marie Jensen and um, Jens Sirak Amundsen and Melina Amundsen and all, all those folks. If I can get a hold of them, get them to sit down, put a microphone on them. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll hear from them directly. And then in in Sweden and, and Denmark, there's people they, like um, the guy who designed the Tahi, now the Rebel Kayak, Johan Worsen. Mm-hmm. If I, I, I mean, I've, I've met him several times. He's a good friend of mine. But but um, if I if I can get to him, I'll interview him and you'll hear from him directly how he designed that kayak, what he was thinking about in that design. And so many other people I've talked about, like like Bjorn Thomason, who designed the Black Pearl Kayak. He's he's a uh, Swedish guy. If I run into him, I'll interview him. <laughs> <laughs> And um, Sarah Wagner, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get her and see who I can find who's available. And then in Greenland, if see, if I go to Nuke, I'll be on the lookout for any of the actual musicians of the music we've heard on the dubcast. Oh, cool. <laughs> so, like, like, you remember, I told the story about seeing, uh, driving with, with Maligak and Angu is walking down the street. And I said, oh, that he says that's Angu. I said, oh, you should have stopped. If I, if I find Angu, I'll talk to him directly <laughs> for, at length about things. But, and I'm, then maybe I'll, I'll walk into Atlantic Music, the the store that I keep talking about has all these these records. And maybe maybe one of the Eisner brothers will be in the store, and I'll interview them there. We'll we'll, we'll see how that goes. But then and then I know you know in, in Nuke there's Nina, who's the the big I think she's still living in Nuke, and then like Kimranok and other people we've heard from. So any any of these people I find, I will uh, get them recorded, and we can hear from them directly. Excellent. Now, how about Maligiak? Are you gonna run Maligiak, into him? Well, I'm, I'm told just found it yesterday. He he he. Somebody relayed a message to him. He he will not be at the competition. He will not he will not even be a nuke. He at during that time period, he's got to go up to Iluliset. It doesn't look like I'll cross paths with him, unfortunately. But that's the way it goes sometimes. Well, as of this recording, just after two weeks since we started the campaign, we are just short of our goal. Although I'm confident it's just a matter of time before we reach that. Less than a hundred dollars away, right? So yeah, yeah. <laughs> even even if we don't get get all that, it, yeah, that's enough. That'll cover the, my costs. So yeah, I'm very very happy and appreciative. Yes. So thanks again, everybody. I can't say it enough. So without further ado, it's our pleasure to present to you Dubcast number fifty four. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Welcome to the Dubcast with Dubside. This is Dubcast number 54. Greenland, Iceland, and Finmen. I'll tell you more about Finmen later. 
And I have music that I did all the way back in dubcast number five, reworked. Song by Marina. I have had people talk to me on occasion who know that I have a great interest in Greenland and have been there many times. And they'll tell me something they've heard recently about Greenland. And pretty early on in the conversation, I'll have to correct them and tell them, no, what you're telling me concerns Iceland, not Greenland. They could be talking about uh, some volcanoes erupting or somebody playing chess in some chess tournament or something like that, and I'll have to tell them, no, you're not, that's not Greenland, that's Iceland. So in order that you don't make that mistake, I'm going to highlight the differences between those two countries. I mean, they're, they're both in the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean. They're both islands. They're both in the Arctic region. But there are some major differences, which I will highlight now. As you can see from a map pretty easily, Greenland is the really, really big one, and Iceland is the smaller one off to the right of Greenland. In terms of population, Greenland, as I have mentioned in the past, has about 60,000 people. Iceland has about six times that many. 375,000. If you're measuring density in people per square mile, Iceland is about 100 times more dense than Greenland. So you've got lots of land, not so many people in Greenland, more people, less land in Iceland. Now going back to the map, the Arctic Circle, which goes around the globe, goes just above Iceland. And it cuts through Greenland about a third of the way up. That would mean that you get very short and very long days, depending on the season. But in Iceland, you don't get the full 24 hours of sunlight or 24 hours of darkness because it's just under the Arctic Circle. The southern towns of Greenland are like that, but the northern parts like Sisimut, Iludiset, Asiat, they have the full 24-hour thing going on. Another big difference between Iceland and Greenland has to do with icebergs and volcanoes. Now, there are glaciers in both places, but the glaciers in Greenland are much bigger. And consequently, they can crank out some pretty large-sized icebergs. First time I went to Greenland, I was quite taken by how blue some of those ice chunks are. I mean, these are smaller pieces, but when they, they flip over, they come up and there's just intense blue color. You think ice is supposed to be white, but it can be extremely blue. And in Iluliset, I can recall looking out onto the horizon and seeing a large mass of snow-covered land in the distance, but not realizing it wasn't actually land. It was just a big, huge iceberg. And a week later, it was gone. Now, icebergs of that size you won't find in Iceland. They have little icebergs, but none of these city block sized ones they do in Greenland. Iceland has volcanoes, lots of volcanoes. Now, Greenland has maybe some extinct volcanoes, but no real volcanic activity. But Iceland, I recall when I first got there, you get off the plane in Keflavik, the airport, and there's a bus that takes you into Reykjavik. And you look out the window of the bus on that bus ride, and it's a, it's a lunar landscape, you know, this desolate, no vegetation kind of a thing. And that is formed over time by volcanic lava flow. Volcanoes in Iceland are erupting on an ongoing basis. And when you have a lot of active volcanoes, you have geothermal activity going on, ground getting hot, and you have hot springs, and you have geysers, which Iceland is noted for. Big tourist attraction, the hot springs. 
Now, in Greenland, there are some areas that have some springs that are maybe not super hot. You could almost call them warm springs, but the, the big tourist attraction hot springs are in Iceland. Iceland, for the most part, is warmer than Greenland. The Gulf Stream current in the Atlantic Ocean comes up and hits Iceland, which helps it stay warmer than it would otherwise be. Regarding animals, Iceland originally had, just for land mammals, the Arctic fox. And later on, at some point, they brought horses to Iceland, which have done okay. Greenland has polar bears. You will not find polar bears in Iceland unless there's a rare occasion some, something drifts over on an iceberg. But for the most part, the polar bears are in Greenland. Horses are in Iceland. There are plenty of whales and seals and fish and birds in both places. In regards to roads and highways... You can get in a car and drive all around Iceland. Not a bad way to see the country. In Greenland, you cannot do that. There are no highways between towns. You either fly or you take a boat or you go on dog sled in the wintertime. So highways, Iceland. No highways, Greenland. And let's consider the people. In Greenland... You have the Inuits, who are the indigenous people of that area, related to those indigenous peoples in northern Canada, as well as all of the indigenous people of the American continent, north and south. In Iceland, the people there are of the Norse or from the Viking lineage. There are no indigenous people in Iceland. At least that's what the archaeological record shows. The, the Sami of northern Norway and Sweden didn't get to Iceland, and the Inuits from Greenland didn't get there before the Vikings got there, which happened, it was settled about the year 900 A.D., the language spoken in Greenland is Greenlandic, Galashtisut, which is an Inuit language. And in Iceland, they speak Icelandic, which is from the original Norse Viking language. They also speak a good deal of English in Iceland. You can go there as a tourist and do quite well just speaking English. Now, you can't say the same thing about Greenland. You run into a lot of situations where the person you need to communicate with can talk to you in Danish or in Greenlandic, but not in English, other than just a couple words. And regarding traditions, long-standing traditions, in Greenland, they have a kayak tradition, obviously, going way, way back. And there is no equivalent long-standing kayak development and use in Iceland. I had the opportunity to do some instruction in Iceland for a kayak club. And they had a lot of fiberglass, you know, British-style kayaks, sea kayaks. And one guy had built a kayak, sort of, maybe you could call it a skin-on-frame kayak, but it was rather crude. Now, I'm sure that somebody in Iceland somewhere has built a skin on frame using some of the books and things we have available today, but Iceland has no long-standing kayak tradition spanning back centuries the way Greenland does. Now, they do have a tradition in Iceland that's maybe not going back hundreds of years, but for quite some time, there is a chess-playing community that is quite thriving. And that this is where, in the 70s, Bobby Fischer had the championship match with Boris Spassky. And they still have tournaments and things in Iceland. So you have a thriving chess community there. Now, I'm sure you could find somebody in Greenland who knows how to play chess, but they don't have 
a really active community of advanced players in Greenland. As far as tourism goes, Iceland is a major tourist destination. They have an infrastructure designed to accommodate anything you could ask for from luxury hotels, five-star restaurants, all the amenities you may be used to. Greenland is a bit more off the beaten path, you could say. I would characterize the difference this way. It's like car camping versus backpacking. If you're camping out of your car and you want to really live it up, you can tow a giant RV behind you and bring along your dish antenna and your large screen TV and your air conditioner and everything else. If you're backpacking, it limits uh, how many of those comfortable amenities you can avail yourself of. Now, that's the situation currently, but I must note that is expected to change. As you may have heard a few weeks ago when I interviewed Kenneth Hoog, the Greenland diplomat, Greenland is undergoing some major expansion. Um, Bigger airports are coming in, and they are going to do a big tourism push. So we'll probably see a few more of those high-end hotels, expensive restaurants, etc., So to continue with my car camping versus backpacking analogy, it's like someone is planning to pave a road to a popular backpacking destination so people can drive their RVs there, for better or worse. So to summarize, Iceland, you've got people of Norse or Viking origins, Greenland, you've got indigenous Inuit people. Iceland, you've got volcanoes, hot springs, and geysers. Greenland, you've got big icebergs. Iceland, you have a major tourist destination. Greenland, you've got a little bit more off the beaten path. And Iceland, you've got horses, highways, chess. Greenland, you've got kayaks and polar bears. So here's the mental picture. So if you're thinking of Iceland, imagine a tourist, dressed up like a tourist with a camera, in a hot spring, relaxing, with geysers in the background, and the tourist has got his camera up to his eye and is taking a picture of a statue of a Viking, and in the far distance there's a volcano. Okay? That's Iceland. Now, Greenland, think of an Inuit with a great big polar bear claw necklace with a kayak paddle in their hand with a great big iceberg in the background. And this person is saying to you, Ayungi, kanahipit. In other words, they're not speaking English. Now, I realize these are broad generalizations, but the idea is to give you a sense of the difference between Greenland and Iceland. I said a minute ago that when the Vikings got to Iceland about seven or 800 A.D., there were no indigenous people there. To me, that raises the question, why? Crossing the Bering Strait through Alaska, through all of Canada, and to Greenland, there was, that's over a thousand years to make that migration. And if they're always in search of better hunting grounds, somebody at some point is going to go a little bit past Greenland, exploring, and discover Iceland. Well, to answer that question, the archaeological evidence indicates that there was a group of people before the modern Inuits who were covering the northern part of North America. And these are referred to as the Dorset people or the Dorset culture. They spread throughout the Arctic region starting about 500 BC and sometime between 1000 and 1500 they were extinct, the evidence indicates. The next wave of people were the Thule culture, who are now the 
Inuits we know today. And they showed up around maybe 1,200 in, in Greenland. There's no strong evidence to indicate that they interacted with the Dorset people at all. So the Dorsets were gone, and then the, the Thule people came along. But if the Thule people got to Greenland by 11 or 1,200, that means that if they went on to Iceland at all, the Vikings were already there. The Vikings had ships, and the Inuits had the Umiak, like the big rowboat kind of a thing, and kayaks. Can you get from Greenland to Iceland in a sealskin-covered, very low-volume Greenland-style kayak? Well, it's possible that Greenlanders got even farther than that. If you look at a map, Iceland is about 200 and some miles from Greenland. And then if you continue to the Faroe Islands going east, that's more than 200 miles. And from the Faroe Islands, you can go down to the Shetland Islands, which is, I don't know, 50, 100 miles or so. And from the Shetland Islands down to the Ornkey Islands, which are off the tip of Scotland, that's another, I don't know, 50 miles or so. And through the Ornkey Islands down to Scotland is shorter than that. So you, you get from Greenland to Scotland, hopping islands that way with some big crossings in between. Or you just take a straight shot from Greenland right to Scotland. But either way, in the early 1600s, on the coast of Scotland, a town called Aberdeen, up on the northern tip there, sort of the northeastern part, a kayak washed up on the beach. And it still had the paddler in it. And the guy was still alive. That kayak to this day can be found in the Aberdeen University Museum there in Scotland. And the story goes that the guy died about three days after he washed up on shore. His, I guess he was very exhausted and in bad shape. By the late 1600s, early 1700s, there were reports of people being seen in kayaks off the coast of Scotland there. Now, some of those may have been for real, and some of them might be somewhat imaginary. There's a whole tradition of Scottish folklore full of fables about elves and things like that. And so they had these characters called Finn men, and Finn men were said to live sometimes on land, but other times in, in underwater in the ocean. And they would try to trap sailors and catch them and various other stories, a whole, whole range of myths and fables there, kind of like an early version of UFOs. These were unidentified floating objects. And like with UFOs we're familiar with, so, some of them somebody really saw something in the air and some of them somebody hyped it all up just to make a big deal about it and feel important and elaborate on something that was mostly in their imagination anyway. But in the case of the kayak in the museum in Aberdeen, that's like having the real UFO in front of you saying this is proof that this thing really happened. So over the years, many people have tried to analyze and explain how do you get in a kayak from Greenland to Scotland? Is that really possible? Harvey Golden, in his 500-page Kayaks of Greenland, uh, Appendix C in the back, he weighs in on this question. And more recently, a British guy named Norman Rogers wrote a book called Searching for the Finn Men. And he apparently got quite obsessed with uh, answering this question. And so he looked at every possible angle, and there's some interesting ideas. Uh, you don't have to paddle the whole way if you have a cold period, which the 1600s were, and there's more ice than usual. So a lot of the distance could be covered on ice, and that would give you a chance to dry out the skin of a sealskin kayak, because after a couple days, the sealskin gets so soggy that you have to dry it out so it, so it still performs like it's supposed to in a kayak. And so being adrift for you know five or six days, that would be a problem. But on ice, you could take care of that. 
And there's also the possibility that this person in a kayak did not originate in Greenland at the time. He had already been brought to Europe because it was somewhat of a practice for the explorers to go out and take people captive, like they're collecting rocks, you know, rocks, plants, people. I'll just take some and bring it home. So a number of these Inuits captured with their kayaks and brought to Europe would escape in their kayak and make off for probably some islands somewhere and could have been living on, say, islands off the coast of Scotland or the Ornkey Island region up there. And that would explain these sightings or the, the guy who showed up in Aberdeen. Well, this book is a fascinating read. As I said, it's called Searching for the Finn Men by Norman Rogers, who himself is a kayaker. And he ties his own personal experiences in with the story of researching. And he looks at the whole Finn Men thing and the, the Aberdeen incident, et cetera. And he, so he, he tries to take every possible explanation and look at it in detail. And in the end, it's still inconclusive. The, there's no one theory that jumps out and says, this, this explains it. It's all just still more questions. But it's uh, quite interesting to read. There is one theory he doesn't get into, he doesn't think of. And he, he does look at, you know, why would somebody start out in that direction? You, of course, you could get blown out in a storm. And we have several accounts of hunters being blown out to sea with, for several days and finally getting back. But I can think of one incentive for taking this kind of a trip that doesn't involve getting blown out by a storm. And that relates to that Kivitok idea that I've mentioned before. The, the Kivitok is a character in Greenland who lives off by himself in the mountains because he's been disgraced in a little village and doesn't want to have to live with the shame. So he, he wanders off, and then if he survives, they're, they're, they were said to have powers of being able to fly and run fast and disappear and things like that. So to, to become a Kivitok, you head up into the mountains and you, you forsake your your life in whatever village you were in. But every account of Kiwi Talks that I've come across talks about you, you Kiwi Talk, you go up into the mountains to become a Kiwi Talk. But I would think that another way to get away from the village and exile yourself would be to get into your kayak and just start paddling. But I don't know if that is the, the proper way to become a Kiwi Talk or if that disqualifies you from the Kiwi Talk identity. I don't know. <laughs> But it's an idea. There is also the matter of navigational techniques, whereas the Aleutians and the, the people in the Polynesian islands had quite sophisticated navigational ideas. Uh, the, the Greenland kayak was made to hunt seals. It was not made to go on multi-day journeys. Um, so it's not known that the seal hunters had any long-range navigational methods. Uh, but who knows, maybe maybe some of that has been lost over time, and they did have the means to go the 200 miles to Iceland and come back. I suppose to test some of these ideas, you could do take a page out of the Thor Heyerdahl playbook. That's the guy who, in 1947, the Kontiki, he took a raft built of native materials from South America out to the Polynesian islands to show that it could be done, that those islands could have been settled by people from the American continent, not from Asia. Somewhat of a different venture there. The, that was a distance of about 4,000 miles. It took over 100 days. The raft had a cabin that was 14 feet wide by 8 feet long, and they had a crew of six. They brought lots of water and food and cooking things, etc. Thing, things you can't get into a little kayak. Since 1947, every 10 years or so, there have been at least half a dozen reenactments of his voyage in various configurations, some of them successful, some not successful. So if somebody wants to prove that you can get to Scotland from Greenland in a sealskin kayak, they can use native materials, driftwood and seal skin, and build a kayak and attempt that voyage. Just remember one thing. 
I didn't tell you to do it, okay? And just one final point on this matter. As Harvey Golden notes, there was a woman, Danish woman named Lona Madsen in 1998 was paddling off the southern part of Greenland in, a, in an exposed area. And her and a partner were, were there, and it got really, really rough. She did not have a role, which is not good if you're going to go out in exposed areas. Anyway, they, they, she capsized, and her partner, it was too, it was too rough to, for him to come to her aid, and she was never seen again. However, her kayak washed up in the Shetland Islands a couple months later. All right, quick review of the difference between Iceland and Greenland. You got a tourist in hot springs with geysers in the background taking a picture of a Viking on a statue, and there's a volcano there somewhere. What country is that? How about an Inuit with a polar bear claw necklace holding a kayak paddle next to a big iceberg? and speaking in a language that is not English. What country is that? The answer should be fairly obvious if you've been paying attention. For the music segment, I will do a song I did back in dubcast number four. And this was originally recorded by Marina. And it is a song that would be sung by a woman, wife of a seal hunter, as she waits for the hunter to come back, hoping that he makes it home safely. Now, in the time of more than a year since I did the song the first time, I've made, tried to make improvements in my equipment and technique and other things. So it's kind of like the software writers, programmers, they, they never finish. They keep giving you updates. So... Here's an update on the, the song Utaki Bunga. Sabe, Leonaga, Luke Tuga. 
song is called Utaki Vunga, which is, translates to I Am Waiting. And that was Marina, M-A-R-I-I-N-A is how she spells her name, from her first CD, that is the title track, that was released all the way back in 1992. And that is still available on AtlanticMusic.gl. So you can get your very own copy and hear the original version of that song. Coming up in episode 55, which may or may not be the next thing aired, but I do have the special guest interviews that come now and then in between. 55 looks at some incidents on the high seas, some of them disastrous, going back 50, almost 100 years, and some of them more recently. And some of these stories involve ships, and some of them involve kayaks. In the meantime, I hope you have a clear distinction in your mind between Greenland and Iceland. Thank you for listening to the Dubcast with Dubside.